afternoon. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. Well, we are continuing in a series called The Power of Love, and we are uh, opening up and exploring this whole concept about what love is. And of course, we are drawing our concepts and our ideas out of the 1 Corinthians 13 uh, chapter in the Bible, which is considered our love chapter, right? So we're looking at that. Now, <clears throat> last week we talked about uh, love is not a feeling, right? Not like we would suppose. It's really not a feeling. It's something that we do. It's an action. It's a behavior that we choose. Now, granted, love does create and produce enormous emotions and feelings, right? But it is uh, not a feeling. It's an action. It's something that you do. And this is so vitally important that you understand this because we're going to lay a foundation here that you have choice who you will love. It's not something just like, oh, I fell in love. Like, you have no control over it. You have control, or I fell out of love, right? You have control, and so that's what we want you to understand, that God has given you control over who and how you will love. So we're going to talk about that. And the aspect today I want to tackle is this kindness aspect, that love is kindness in action. And so therefore, I've entitled today's message, Love is Kind, Love is Kind. Now, Jesus, he tells us a story to illustrate this point about the kindness in love in action, and it's called the Good Samaritan. And many of you might be familiar with that story. It's about three men who are on a journey, and they're traveling from Jerusalem down to J Jericho. And uh, they take this notorious road that is known for people jumping them and, you know, jumping people on it or beating them up, mugging them, <clears throat> and stuff like that. And so these three men are, at different times, they come upon what I'm going to call a crime scene, <laughs> okay? They come upon this crime scene, and they all have different reactions. And so I want you to look at those reactions. There are three specific ones I want us to look at, because I believe that these three reactions are ones that you and I have in life when we encounter things, especially when we encounter people in need and people in pain. So... Let's jump in. Let's look right at that. The first attitude that we see that's on your outline is this about keeping my distance, <clears throat> about keeping my distance attitude. And this is what it says in Luke 10, starting at verse 30, 31. It says, there was a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him, stripped him, beat him up, and left him for half dead. And now it so happened that a priest was going down the road but when they saw the man, when he saw the man, he walked on the other side. Now I want you to circle that word, walked on the other side. What he did is he avoided the situation, didn't he? Right? right? <clears throat> so the first attitude that we can see is that of a, an attitude where I want to just keep my distance. I want to avoid what's going on. I don't want to get too close because if I get too close, somebody might ask me for help. Right. right? So how does that translate to us? We can have that, keep people at arm's length, right? We don't want them to get too close. So we keep all, most of our, our uh, relationships at a shallow uh, type of a existence so that people can't ask too much of us. They can't demand too much. So we keep them at arm's length. So again, this guy walking down, this priest, he sees this guy beaten up, mugged, left for dead, and he goes, oh, I don't want to get involved, and I'm going to keep my distance. I'm going to go on and do my business. Now, the second attitude that we see that's demonstrated here is that of the curious but uninvolved. The curious but uninvolved. And we see that, and I move to the next verse here in 32. It says this. In the same way, a Levite also came there. He went over, looked at the man, and then walked on by the other side. Wow, right? So this Levite, now, he's not a gene salesman, by the way, right? He's a temple assistant, and so he's walking by in this crime scene. He sees it. Now he's going to go and he's going to investigate. He's going to go over. He's going to look at this guy who's been victimized. And he's going to survey the land, right? And then he's, because he's curious, but then he's going to leave. He's just going to walk away. He's, un, he's uninvolved, right? He's curious, but he's uninvolved. Now, I know if you're like me, you're like, really? I mean, who, I mean really? Somebody's just going to look at somebody that's all beaten up and stuff and just walk away, Right? And we can get really self-righteous in that thing. I would never do that. But I would beckon to differ. I think a lot of us do this. How so, Sharon? Well, I think when we're going like down the interstate, right, and there's an accident, what happens to the traffic? Slows down. Why? Because everybody wants to gawk and look who's been hurt. Is somebody I know? Somebody been killed, right? And so everything just kind of slows down so people can look, they can observe, but they don't want to be involved. You don't see them getting out and helping, do you? 
Now, they have their reasons. We all have our reasons. So we're curious, but we're not involved. We are what I call aware, but we're apathetic about it. Now, here comes the third attitude that I see, the one the Good Samaritan had, and that's to treat others how I want to be treated. Treating others as I want to be treated. And we see that in Luke 10, starting at the verse 33 this time. A Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon a man, and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity, right? So here you go. We're talking about love in this series, how to grow in love. And this is a great example of it here. Here's somebody who chooses to love. They choose to be, have this loving kindness, right? And here's the point. You and I, we have these different things that are going to come into our lives, and you can choose how you're going to react. You can react with a distance. I don't even want to look at it. I'm just going to go on my business. Or you can, you know, look at it, but go, yeah, I just don't, I want to stay uninvolved. Or you can be all in, right? You can be all in. And so that's what I'm going to uh, suggest that we do today. I want to spend the rest of my time talking to you. Now, I am very well aware that Satan doesn't want you to hear this message today. Okay? All my services, I have had different things go on because I believe that this is at the very heart of what it means to love Jesus and love other people. And so I want you to bow your heads and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and to just to still us and to, to have the distractions go away. So bow your heads. Holy Spirit, you are in this room, and I give you complete authority and control over this room and over our hearts, Lord God. Yes, Father. Now, Lord, you know that we cannot love others if we do not feel your love. We sang about it. We worship you this morning, Father. And I ask, Lord, now that you have deposited in us, that you would open up our understanding so that we can see how to give it out, Father, that we can see how to impact those around us with this very thing called kindness and love in action, Lord. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come and would you cause us to be at rest and to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, to be able to know that we matter to you, that, that you hear our heartbeat and that you indeed love us. Come, Father, come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to learn about how to become a kinder person today, all right? So on your outline, the very first thing I'm going to suggest is that you see the needs of people around you, that you see the needs of people around you, right? See, kindness always begins, I think, with being able to see, being able to see and have vision for what's happening around you, to be observant, to be sensitive to the people's needs that are around you. Because quite frankly, if you can't see it, then you can never care about it, right? So we have to see first. Where do I get this idea? Well, again, the Samaritan in this 33, verse 33 comment here, it says, when he saw, when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. Now I want you to circle the word saw. That's what I'm after. We have to be able to see. That's our starting point. We have to be sensitive to what's going on around us to expand our vision and to be able to be observant to the people around that God has placed us. You see, there are wounded people everywhere. Everywhere. They're all around you. They're people that are sitting right next to you. If you just look down the aisles, I guarantee you couldn't get look far enough before you'd run into somebody who's wounded and they need you they need they need to be encouraged today so why don't why don't we do that then if we can see them then why don't we stop why don't we help well i think it's because we get so busy we have our agenda pastor sharon you got exactly 30 minutes to get that <laughs> sermon done right we, we try to get through everything that we can and we have our agenda and we're in a hurry to accomplish it right and in that hurriedness we are not able to show kindness We're going too fast. To show kindness, we need to slow down. We need to slow down. What I mean by that, what I mean by this is like, if you and I were going to go on a a trip, right? Let's say I wanted to go explore America, and so did you. And so I said, let's go on a trip. You know, we could take many forms of transportation that we could leave the East Coast and go to the West Coast, right? We could jump on a plane here in Norfolk, and we can be in L.A. with a short little trip, right? We can be in LA for in, in about eight hours with a layover, right? And, but we wouldn't see much of America. And if I said, well, let's just drive there then. You know, we'd get in our car and we go cross country. We would see more than if we were on a plane. Absolutely. 
But if we really wanted to experience it, if we really wanted to taste and see what America was like, we would hike. We would hike across from one coast to the next. You would get the most amount of uh, being able to experience something, be able to see what America was really like. Here's my point, guys. When you slow down, you see more. When you slow down, you see more. And so that's what I'm suggesting. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, look out for the good of others. Look out for the good of others. That look out that we're talking about is seeing. God says to us, he gives us a command. He wants you to see the people around you. Now that can be oh so intimidating. So one of the things that I do is I ask the Holy Spirit, which is God's presence that lives inside of us, I say, come Holy Spirit, because I need him to show me to open up my spiritual eyes so I can actually see people around me. You see, I'm aware that people need a hug. They need to be loved. They need what you have to give. Now, as I'm talking about this being more sensitive to the environment, there are some of you that go, hey, this is a slam dunk. I get this. I was born with little antennae, right? And I can read the room and and I can read people's body language. I'm kind of wired up that way I got it. And you kind of excused yourself here. And then there's other views that you, you don't have a clue in the world, you know? Somebody could be in a ball next to you crying, and you go, oh, there might be a problem. <laughs> you know, and you feel uncomfortable, right? It's like a foreign language. It's hard. Hey, listen, I get it. I get it. Pastor Andy and I are on two opposite extremes on this one, right? When it comes to sensitivity, I'm way sensitive and he is not, right? <laughs> well, and, and it's not a surprise. When we went through our premarital counseling uh, before we were married, my, uh, the guy that was doing it, you know, we take all the little indicators and stuff like how we would do together. And one of the things when he came up about this, you know, being able to sense your environment and stuff, he said, hmm, you guys are in for a bumpy ride. <laughs> and he said, it's kind of like this. You both are what he's call, he called us EMT people, emergency medical team, you know, where we rush in, where, where we see people that are in crisis or they need help or are lost, right? And so both Andy and I are sold out for that, so we're going full force into that. And he said, and Sharon, you're going to be the type of person that's going to know how to get there the fastest. You're going to figure it out and navigate it. And Andy's going to always like to drive the ambulance. <laughs> and I go, okay, we got that. And we worked really good. We work in harmony with that. But it's when we get to the scene that it begins to get stuff, right? Because I'll get out. I'm usually the first one with the person. And I'm down there on the ground kneeling and, and I'm petting the person and I'm dressing their wounds and I'm praying for them and reassuring them it's going to be okay and give me a blanket and, you know, I'm wrapping them up and telling them how I'm going to put them in the ambulance and just talking to them. And Andy now, he's jumped out of the ambulance, Right? He's jumped out of the ambulance. He's looking at me thinking, just pick the person up and throw them in, right? <laughs> you know, he's, he's thinking, just get there the fastest. And he's losing his mind with me, you know, down there on the ground. Hey, it's hard when you're extremes. Now, I've been married for 27 years, so I've been working on this, <laughs> okay? Here you go. And this is a word for many of you who are married to people that are in extremes or you've got a child, or you've got a worker, or you've got somebody you have to deal with, and you are on opposite ends. Listen, God puts you together. He puts you together so that you can work together. You see, one of the things, it took me, I had to grow in the Lord before I realized that Andy was my gift in this respect, that indeed I had been on the one end of the continuum, and sharing my life with him, I learned a lot I learned how to not get so caught up with a person that I, that I miss my calling, right? That I miss what I was supposed to do, get him in the ambulance and get him to the hospital because I can get locked up in that moment. And then if Andy were up here, he'd tell you that he's learning as he did last week. He would say to you that he's learning still to recognize people's emotions, to be able to sense what's going on and to know that he needs to become aware so that he can care more, right? Right? And so we're learning these things. And I put it out there again to tell you that if you have people around you, know that those are precious gifts that God has given you, right? And so you seek to what the Father is doing to bring balance, to make you a child of the God Most High. Now, this point here, there are those of you that are uh, dull to the senses. And so I'm going to encourage you to call upon the Holy Spirit. If you know who that is, if you've accepted him as your savior, you call upon him. Say, I don't know what to do. When you see something and it, you know, 
pray and ask. Just say, Holy Spirit, come and show me what to do. Okay? So that's going to help you a lot. Now, each section, I'm going to have you rate yourself. Why? Because I believe, especially these first two, are huge in being able to develop a heart that would be able to show loving kindness to people. So this first one, I want you to rate yourself on how kind you are, right? The kindness of being able to sense what's going on around you. So if you're really uh, clueless and you can't figure it out, you're more on the one. If you've got it figured out and you do great, put it on the five. And if you're still unsure and you're looking at the one through five and you're getting panicked, <laughs> you can do it later. But what I'm going to suggest you do is to list those people that you see every day or every other day. Just list them the five or six. And if you can't put beside them what their number one struggle is, right, then you probably need to grow in this area. Go ahead and rate yourself right this moment. Okay? Now, while you're doing that, we talked about loving kindness. Starts with being sensitive to things around you. Number two, what the Good Samaritan did and what you and I do is we need to be sympathetic with people's pain. We need to sympathize with people's pain. Now, I see that in Luke 10, 33, when it said, when he saw him, watch this, his heart was filled with what? Pity, with pity. And so what we see here is that he is feeling what this guy is feeling. He's emotionally tying in. The Bible says to weep with those that weep, and that's exactly what's happening here. It's not that he's just seeing it. He feels sorrow. He enters into this man's pain. So then the question becomes, how do we do that exactly? If sensing is about seeing things in the room, well, then what is empathizing? Empathizing is what I consider just being a good listener. You empathize by being a good listener. Actually, that's, that, that one there is the secret of great empathy, is to be able to sit and listen, not to fix and to straighten stuff up, just to listen, to listen to people, right? Now, sympathizing with people is one of your basic needs that people have. How so? Because when you listen and somebody's talking to you, it validates how they feel. And it helps to, to know that somebody else understands them. And so that's how we sympathize, and it's so very, very important. Galatians 6.2 says this, Share with each other troubles and problems. <clears throat> yeah, I see that. Okay, the troubles and problems. I need to stop there. Troubles and problems. In our culture, are you to share that you have troubles and problems? No. You never show weakness, right? Well, the scripture says if we share our troubles and our problems, this is how we do the law of Christ. So what is the law of Christ? The law of Christ is just learning to love him with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and to love others as yourself. And so when we share with each other, when we become vulnerable with one another and bring them in to where we're at, we allow other people's problems to come in and touch us, then we are indeed following the law of Christ here. And after all, doesn't each and every one of us want somebody to be able to sympathize with us when we're in pain? Of course we do. So just do that for somebody else. Be a good listener. Now, guys, I'm also very aware that God allows pain to come into our lives to make us more sympathetic. Really? Yeah, he does. You see, I'm one who had a learning disability growing up, meaning that I could never get it the way those teachers wanted, not in grade school, college, never, never, not even in grad school, right? It was always very hard. And because of that, I grew in my sympathy. I understood more, so it, it tenderized me. And I can remember praying, and I believe that God hears and he heals. And when I prayed to him to remove that, to help me, right, because it was in line, wasn't in line, I thought, with my calling, God told me, no, Sharon, no, because it's in your very weakness that my strength shows best. And so my grace is sufficient for you. And so even when I stand up here today, it's because of the grace of Jesus Christ. I can do nothing without him. But what happens is I'm so reliant on him because I'm so well aware of the fact that I lack in so many areas that what happens is his power is able to move freely inside of this little lady. You see that? So God will give you things to cause you to learn to be empathetic. Look at the scriptures. This is just in my opinion. 2 Corinthians 1.4 says, God comforts and strengthens us in our hardship and our trials so that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass it on to them 
the same help and comfort that God has given us. Do you see that? So he wants to be able to tenderize our heart. So my question then becomes, how do you rate yourself? How do you do with this? Are you a sympathetic type person? Can you go there? Can you feel you know, with, with other people? Can, are you a good listener? Or do you always have to have the solution, right? So if you, if you need work on this, give yourself a one or a two. But if you think you've got this done, then you're more on the four and five end. Go ahead and put something down there. Okay, the first two that I've talked to you about are extremely important. They actually are the base of everything. It's this first one, this first step of being able to see and sense what's going on around you in your environment. And this second one of sympathizing, being able to empathize with people emotionally. Those two are the greatest things to be able to to build in a person to be able to love and loving kindness towards other people. Now, what else do we see that the prodigal or the the Good Samaritan did here for us? Well, he taught us to seize the moment. So on number three, it's seize the moment to be kind. Seize that moment to be kind. Now the word seize means grab, don't delay, go for it right then and there. Luke 10 says this, he, the Samaritan, went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. So here you go, it's love in action. That's what he did. He loved this guy. He moved into action to help him. You know, when I, when I look at what he's done here, some people ask me, why wine and oil? Well, I'm, I can just tell you that's what he had on the donkey. <laughs> okay? He used what he had here. Now, I'm going to make a point. He used what he had. The wine, it could have been an antiseptic, and the, the wine, you know, and the uh, oil there is just to soothe, uh, you know, soothe a, a, a hurt right? And then it said he bandaged him up. He didn't have a first aid kit, did he? And bandages? No, no, no. So what did he bandage him with? His shirts. He ripped them into pieces and he bandaged the guy. So this Samaritan has shown us that he seized the moment. He took whatever he had and he used it. He used it. He didn't wait for the conditions to be perfect. He just used what was there. And you and I, we need to do that. In Proverbs 3, 27, 28, it says, this, never walk away from someone who deserves your help. Your hand, I love this part, your hand is God's hand for that purpose. Your hand is God's hand for that person. Never tell your neighbors to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. Listen, if somebody deserves help, if you see something, right, you are to go to that person and to help them. You know, the whole world tells us to look past it. Don't stop your agenda to keep going. But I tell you, as a voice crying in the wilderness, if you just look down your, your lane today, I guarantee you there are people that are hurting, not just physically, but emotionally or spiritually, financially, that there are people right in your midst, that they just need you to pat them on the back, to tell them it's going to be okay. They need your loving kindness. They need it today. Will you seize that moment? In order to do it like the Good Samaritan did, then we have to follow two of his principles that he gives us. The first one is we have to be interruptible. You know, as I said before, we set up our lives with agendas that we've got for today. That's my day off, right? Got lots of things to do. But if we don't get to a place where we will let our schedules be interrupted, then we cannot show loving kindness because the very nature of loving kindness calls upon us at the most inconvenient times. And so we have to be ready and willing to answer it when they call us to change our schedules. The next thing is we have to be risk takers. We have to be courageous. You see, when I see see this guy here, what he's doing, right? This Samaritan is, he has a lot of fears that were legit, but he steps right over them. Well, what kind of fears then exactly, Sharon? Well, when I look, I, I can imagine he's thinking to himself, these robbers still might be around, right? And I could become a casualty. He's also, you know, thinking, hey, if I get down, now this is my movie background, but if I get down to help this person, they might jump and hurt me and take my goods, right? Maybe I watch too many many movies, but that's what I think, right? Or or that if somebody walked by and saw him, they might think he's part of that gang that beat that guy up. Or the one that gets me the most is he could have been rejected. Rejection, right? See, he's a Samaritan, this guy's a Jew. They hated each other. There was discrimination going on, right? So when he bent down to do all these things, this guy could have looked at him and spit in his eye. 
But the good Samaritan here, he steps over all those things to go towards showing loving kindness. Now, you and I, we are going to face those kinds of things, and they're legitimate fears in our lives, but we got to tackle them. Fears like, what if somebody sues me? Or, gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm not trained in medical care, right? But if you remember, empathizing requires you to listen, and that requires no training, right? Just being there for somebody, just being in the moment with them. And so we can help people. And I think the reason we don't is because fear sometimes rises up inside of us and, and it wants to seize our heart. And I think that fear makes us unkind. But yet the word says that perfect love, what? Casts out all fear. And so we need to know that Jesus Christ is enough to help you in the moment to be able to be loving and kind to people around you. Now Matthew seven twelve says, Always treat others as you would like them to treat you. That is our golden rule. That's what we want to aspire to. So we're talking about spontaneously coming to people's aid. How do you do with that? Do you like delay a lot and think about it, analyze it? Then you're on the one. If you've got this thing nailed down and you are interruptible and you are willing to risk take, then you're on the five side. So go ahead and do that and then we'll go into this last one. Okay, very good. Very good. The last one I want to talk to you is about what I see him doing, the Samaritan doing here. He spent whatever it took. He spent whatever it takes to render aid here, right? And it does cost us to be kind. It does cost you. It's going to cost you uh, sometimes with your money, your time, your energy, your efforts. It causes you to lose your privacy. And sometimes even, even your reputation can be on the line. It costs you. In uh, Luke 10, 34 and 35, it says this, Then the man, which is a good Samaritan, put the, put the other man, the wounded guy, right? Put the man on his own donkey, and he took him to an inn where he took care of him. Now watch this. The next day he handed the innkeeper two pieces of silver, and he told him to keep, to take care of the man. If his bill runs higher than that, he said, I'll pay the difference the next time I'm here. So the guy leaves this credit card number and says, hey, this guy needs more help. I'm going to foot the bill for it. It's amazing. It's ama this is a complete stranger. And yet our good Samaritan is able to help this guy and even give of his own resources and his time. That night he took care of him and he left his card for him. Guys, this kindness. Did, did the guy, did the Samaritan receive anything in return? Absolutely not. He got nothing in return. So why should we stop our lives? Why should we show loving kindness? Well, I could do a Bible study and come up with a gazillion reasons, you know, all the way from, you know, kindness is, is, is an act of worship and honor. Just God makes us feel good. God rewards it. But I cannot get away from the number one reason that we should show loving kindness. It's because you and I have been showing such love such kindness from our Heavenly Father that we need to pour it out. You see, when, we, when I was far from God, when I was a sinner far from Him, making terrible, terrible choices, my Father loved me. He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, so that I would have a way, a salvation, to be able to be back with Him. And so He gave me that. He gives it to you too. He gave you the ability to be children of the God Most High, with the Son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that he shed on the cross for us. And those of that have accepted that, and we know that as truth, and we've prayed that prayer to ask Christ to come into our life and to lead our life, he doesn't just give us the promise of eternal life. He comes and indwells us with the Holy Spirit so that we have the strength to live out this life to the God's glory and to the purpose that he has given us in our hearts. And there's the ultimate kindness that was shown to us and because of that reason, I need to be kind to other people. Now, just as I'm talking, I know there are people that you come in here for a variety of reasons, and you don't know Jesus like I just talked about him, and you don't have that connection with the Heavenly Father. Well, I'm going to end in prayer in a few minutes, and I'm going to invite you to pray that prayer that I prayed, you know, 32 years ago that has made all the difference in the world for me. And I'll give you that opportunity to pray. It's between you and God, not the people around you. But when you pray that and you ask Jesus Christ to become the leader of your life, he indeed comes. I don't care how much sin, how much junk you have in your life. 
He accepts you when you call upon his name. He is that way. He's a loving, kind father. Now, guys, in this series that we're going through, we are talking about how to love. We're talking about it, and we're having to study. But listen, every time I went to pray about this message and about this whole series, I keep hearing the word practitioner, practitioner. (laughs) And what that means is I want them to practice it. I want them to practice it, Sharon. So I've asked my, one of my pastors, Pastor Debbie, who's uh, in charge of the outreaches, I said, can you give me a list of things that we can do in our community and kindness? And indeed, she gave that list, and you have it. You were handed it when you came in this morning. It says random acts of kindness. And so there's a whole bunch you can go through. You can do them by yourself. You can do them with a group, right? All the way from picking up a check, you know, at a restaurant for somebody else to perhaps watching somebody who's... Uh, you know, that you know that's going through a, a major life change, whether they're having a kid or moving or they're ill, and you can bring them something to eat, right? Those acts of kindness are there for you. And so I challenge you to take one of them, but I'm going to highlight something else. In addition to that, I had her put that last line in there for you, which is to sign up for a ministry on a weekend service, right? I mean, you guys come in and you sit here and you enjoy what's happening, but you know there's a lot that goes on to producing this, right? Right? To, to having this kind of a, a meeting, all the way to children and youth and greeters and ushers and, my goodness, the cafe workers. There's so much going on around you. And so I'm going to challenge you today, if you're not currently in a ministry, get involved. Be part of the body. Minister to one another by serving each other, by helping each other out. And what better way than on the weekend to do that? All right? So they're taking names and stuff at the information table as you leave no pressure, but I think this is one of those opportunities uh, to put out there that, that they would love to have you. I would like to see you involved. Now, Galatians 6.10, I'll end up with this. Whenever we have the opportunity, and if you haven't noticed, I've given you the opportunity today, <laughs> just to make that clear. Whenever you have the opportunity to help somebody, we should do it. But we should give special attention to those who are in the family of believers family of believers is church people, right? It's people that you hang out with. People are in this four walls, right? And so we should be extra mindful of these folks, not to the exclusion of folks out, out beyond this walls that you're sitting in today, but especially we need to, to give attention to the people that are sitting in the rows and how can we help them? Well, you start ministering and you watch. God will open up doors for you. Okay, why don't you stand? I'm gonna close this in prayer. Okay, I'm going to ask the uh, prayer team to come forward. As the prayer team's making their way up, let me tell you, I asked them to come forward because I know whenever we talk about things that it brings up stuff. And so if you have something specifically you would like us to pray for you, after the service, we're always down front and we'd be glad to do that with you, okay? All right, so yeah, why don't you bow your heads and let's just see where the Holy Spirit's going to lead us in this prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Father, I thank you that you have challenged us, Lord. You challenged us to put down the guardedness. Father says he'll never knock down your walls that you erect to protect yourself, but then you can't touch him. He can't. He stops at that wall because he's a respecter of all men and all women. So if you pull it down, he'll speak to you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you've been moving amongst us, Lord. Yes. Mm. Okay, first I have to go after those that don't have that close relationship. And so all those of you who have made this decision, you be praying right now. You know how important this is. And for my guests that are in here, and you have not made that decision to follow Jesus Christ, that The only time you use his name is when you get angry. 
The Lord knows. He sees you. Your friend might have brought you here today, but really it was God orchestrating it. He wanted you here today. He wanted you to hear that you mattered to him, that he accepts you just where you are right now, that he knows you. He knows your name. And so if you'd like this personal relationship with him, right where you're at, like I said, it only involves you and him, but I'll lead you in a prayer. And you just say, Father God, I don't understand everything, but the best I do right now, I reach for you. I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my savior. And I thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me my sins. And I ask you to deposit your Holy Spirit in me. Now, Lord, for those that were praying that prayer, I thank you that you said you just sealed it in their heart. Father heard your words. He heard your whisper. And he wrote in his book of life, your name. Father, I ask that you would take that now, that you would deepen their walk. And Lord, just as you've been speaking to us today, I know and I'm very aware, Father, that there is nothing that I can do. There is no amount of loving kindness that Sharon Mead can do because she's thwarted with sin. And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would wash me and wash all those that are hearing, Father, in the blood of Jesus Christ, that you would cause us, Lord, to be able to step over the things that would pull us down and say, well, nobody showed us kindness. Nobody's done that for us. That we would be able to, to bring those things down, Father. Anything that would try to raise up to say, don't help, don't sympathize, don't recognize. Pull those down in the name of Jesus. And I know, okay. And Father, would you give creativeness? Would you release creativeness now in the hearts of those that heard your, your spirit today that are already thinking about the work? They're thinking about a spouse. They're thinking about children. Would you give them creativeness so that they can see, Lord, how they might take this message and these points and use them, Father, as a light. Use it, Father, to love others into this relationship with you, Lord. And I thank you, Father. Yeah. Yes. And so, Father, I thank you that you just said that in these things, as we go forward and that we learn to love in the loving kindness, the Father has just said, it is there that you learn to love me. That's the demonstration of loving me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with every breath of life that you have. It's there that you can love your neighbor. It's there that you fulfill the greatest commandment. So Father, again I ask, as a pastor who loves her sheep, Lord, that you would help each and every one that's here today. In Jesus' name, amen.